The Turn of the Screw The story had held us round the fire, sufficiently breathless, but except the obvious remark that it was gruesome, as on Christmas Eve in an old house a strange tale should essentially be, I remember no comment uttered till somebody happened to say that it was the only case he had met in which such a visitation had fallen on a child. The case, I may mention, was that of an apparition in just such an old house as had gathered us for the occasion, an appearance of a dreadful kind to a little boy sleeping in the room with his mother and waking her up in the terror of it. Waking her not to dissipate his dread and soothe him to sleep again, but to encounter also herself before she had succeeded in doing so, the same sight that had shaken him. It was this observation that drew from Douglas, not immediately, but later in the evening, a reply that had the interesting consequence to which I call attention. Someone else told a story not particularly effective, which I saw he was not following. This I took for a sign that he had himself something to produce, and that we should only have to wait. We waited, in fact, till two nights later. But that same evening, before we scattered, he brought out what was in his mind. I quite agree, in regard to Griffin's ghost, or whatever it was, that its appearing first to the little boy at so tender an age adds a particular touch. But it's not the first occurrence of its charming kind that I know to have involved a child. If the child gives the effect another turn of the screw, what do you say to two children? We say, of course, somebody exclaimed, that they give two turns, also that we want to hear about them. I can see Douglas there before the fire, to which he had got up to present his back, looking down with his hands in his pockets. Nobody but me till now has ever heard. It's quite too horrible. This naturally was declared by several voices to give the thing the utmost price, and our friend with quiet art prepared his triumph by turning his eyes over the rest of us and going on, It's beyond everything. Nothing at all that I know touches it. For sheer terror, I remember asking. He seemed to say it was not so simple as that, to be really at a loss how to qualify it. He passed his hand over his eyes, made a little wincing grimace for dreadful dreadfulness. Oh, how delicious, cried one of the women. He took no notice of her. He looked at me, but as if, instead of me, he saw what he spoke of. For general uncanny ugliness and horror and pain. Well then, I said, just sit right down and begin. He turned round to the fire, gave a kick to a log, watched it an instant. Then, as he faced us again, I can't begin. I shall have to send to town. There was a unanimous groan at this, and much reproach, after which, in his preoccupied way, he explained, The story's written. It's in a locked drawer. It's not been out for years. I could write to my man and enclose the key. He could send down the packet as he finds it. It was to me in particular that he appeared to propound this, appeared almost to appeal for aid not to hesitate. He had broken a thickness of ice, the formation of many a winter, had had his reasons for a long silence. The others resented postponement, but it was just his scruples that charmed me. I adjured him to write by the first post, and to agree with us for an early hearing. Then I asked him if the experience in question had been his own. To this his answer was prompt, Oh, thank God, no! And is the record yours? You took the thing down? Nothing but the impression. I took that here. He tapped his heart. I've never lost it. Then your manuscript is in old faded ink, and in the most beautiful hand.
He hung fire again. A woman's. She's been dead these twenty years. She sent me the pages in question before she died. They were all listening now, and of course there was somebody to be arch, or at any rate to draw the inference. But if he put the inference by without a smile, it was also without irritation. She was a most charming person, but she was ten years older than I. She was my sister's governess, he quietly said. She was the most agreeable woman I've ever known in her position. She would have been worthy of any whatever. It was long ago, and this episode was long before. I was at Trinity, and I found her at home on my coming down the second summer. I was much there that year. It was a beautiful one and we had in her off hours some strolls and talks in the garden, talks in which she struck me as awfully clever and nice. Oh, yes, don't grin. I liked her extremely, and am glad to this day to think she liked me too. If she hadn't, she wouldn't have told me. She had never told anyone. It wasn't simply that she said so, but that I knew she hadn't. I was sure. I could see. You'll easily judge why when you hear. Because the thing had been such a scare? He continued to fix me. You'll easily judge, he repeated. You will. I fixed him too. I see. She was in love. He laughed for the first time. You are acute. Yes, she was in love. That is, she had been. That came out. She couldn't tell her story without its coming out. I saw it, and she saw I saw it, but neither of us spoke of it. I remember the time and the place, the corner of the lawn, the shade of the great beeches, and the long, hot summer afternoon. It wasn't a scene for a shudder, but oh, he quitted the fire and dropped back into his chair. "'You'll receive the packet Thursday morning?' I inquired. "'Probably not till the second post. Well, then, after dinner. You'll all meet me here?' He looked us round again. "'Isn't anybody going?' It was almost the tone of hope. "'Everybody will stay?' "'I will, and I will,' cried the ladies, whose departure had been fixed. Mrs. Griffin, however, expressed the need for a little more light. Who was it she was in love with? The story will tell, I took upon myself to reply. Oh, I can't wait for the story. The story won't tell, said Douglas. Not in any literal, vulgar way. More's the pity, then. That's the only way I ever understand. Won't you tell, Douglas? somebody else inquired. He sprang to his feet again. Yes, tomorrow. Now I must go to bed. Good night. And quickly catching up a candlestick, he left us slightly bewildered. From our end of the great brown hall, we heard his step on the stair, whereupon Mrs. Griffin spoke. Well, if I don't know who she was in love with, I know who he was. She was ten years older, said her husband. Raison de plus, at that age. But it's rather nice, his long reticence. Forty years, Griffin put in, with this outbreak at last. The outbreak, I returned, will make a tremendous occasion of Thursday night. We had it from him again before the fire in the hall, as we had had our mild wonders of the previous night. It appeared that the narrative he had promised to read us really required for a proper intelligence a few words of prologue. Let me say here distinctly, to have done with it, that this narrative, from an exact transcript of my own made much later, is what I shall presently give. Poor Douglas, before his death, when it was in sight, committed to me the manuscript that reached him on the third of these days, and that, on the same spot, with immense effect, he began to read 
to our hushed little circle on the night of the fourth. The departing ladies, who had said they would stay, didn't, of course, thank heaven, stay. They departed, in consequence of arrangements made, in a rage of curiosity, as they professed, produced by the touches with which he had already worked us up. But that only made his little final auditory more compact and select, kept it round the hearth subject to a common thrill. The first of these touches conveyed that the written statement took up the tale at a point after it had, in a manner, begun. The fact to be in possession of was therefore that his old friend, the youngest of several daughters of a poor country parson, had, at the age of twenty, on taking service for the first time in the schoolroom, come up to London in trepidation to answer in person an advertisement that had already placed her in brief correspondence with the advertiser. This person proved, on her presenting herself for judgment, at a house in Harley Street, that impressed her as vast and imposing. This prospective patron proved a gentleman, a bachelor in the prime of life, such a figure as had never risen, save in a dream or an old novel, before a fluttered, anxious girl out of a Hampshire vicarage. One could easily fix his type. It never happily dies out. He was handsome and bold and pleasant, off-hand and gay and kind. He struck her inevitably as gallant and splendid. But what took her most of all, and gave her the courage she afterwards showed, was that he put the whole thing to her as a kind of favour, an obligation he should gratefully incur. She conceived him as rich, but as fearfully extravagant, saw him all in a glow of high fashion, of good looks, of expensive habits, of charming ways with women. He had for his town residence a big house filled with the spoils of travel and the trophies of the chase. But it was to his country home, an old family place in Essex, that he wished her immediately to proceed. He had been left, by the death of their parents in India, guardian to a small nephew and a small niece, children of a younger, a military brother, whom he had lost two years before. These children were, by the strangest of chances for a man in his position, a lone man without the right sort of experience or a grain of patience, very heavily on his hands. It had all been a great worry, and, on his part doubtless, a series of blunders, but he immensely pitied the poor chicks, and had done all he could, had in particular sent them down to his other house, the proper place for them being, of course, the country, and kept them there from the first, with the best people he could find to look after them, parting even with his own servants to wait on them, and going down himself, whenever he might, to see how they were doing. The awkward thing was that they had practically no other relations, and that his own affairs took up all his time. He had put them in possession of Bly, which was healthy and secure, and had placed at the head of their little establishment, but below stairs only, an excellent woman, Mrs. Gross, whom he was sure his visitor would like, and who had formerly been made to his mother. She was now housekeeper, and was also acting for the time as superintendent to the little girl, of whom, without children of her own, she was, by good luck, extremely fond. There were plenty of people to help, but, of course, the young lady who should go down as governess would be in supreme authority. She would also have, in holidays, to look after the small boy, who had been for a term at school, young as he was to be sent, but what else could be done? And who, as the holidays were about to begin, would be back from one day to the other? There had been for the two children at first a young lady whom they had had the misfortune to lose. She had done for them quite beautifully. She was a most respectable person, till her death, the great awkwardness of which had, precisely, left no alternative but the school for little miles. Mrs. Gross, since then, in the way of manners and things, had done as she could for Flora. And there were, further, a cook, a housemaid, a dairywoman, an old pony, an old groom, and an old gardener all likewise thoroughly respectable. So far had Douglas presented his picture, 
when someone put a question. And what did the former governess die of? Of so much respectability? Our friend's answer was prompt. That will come out. I don't anticipate. Excuse me, I thought that was just what you are doing. In her successor's place, I suggested, I should have wished to learn if the office brought with it uh, necessary danger to life. Douglas completed my thought. She did wish to learn. And she did learn. You shall hear tomorrow what she learnt. Meanwhile, of course, the prospect struck her as slightly grim. She was young, untried, nervous. It was a vision of serious duties and little company, a really great loneliness. She hesitated, took a couple of days to consult and consider, but the salary offered much exceeded her modest measure, and on a second interview she faced the music. She engaged. And Douglas, with this, made a pause that, for the benefit of the company, moved me to throw in, the moral of which was, of course, the seduction exercised by the splendid young man. She succumbed to it. He got up, and as he had done the night before, went to the fire, gave a stir to a log with his foot, then stood a moment with his back to us. She saw him only twice. Yes, but that's just the beauty of her passion. A little to my surprise, on this, Douglas turned round to me. It was the beauty of it. There were others, he went on, who hadn't succumbed. He told her frankly all his difficulty, that for several applicants the conditions had been prohibitive. They were somehow simply afraid. It sounded dull. It sounded strange, and all the more so because of his main condition, which was that she should never trouble him, but never, never, neither appeal nor complain nor write about anything, only meet all questions herself, receive all monies from his solicitor, take the whole thing over and let him alone. She promised to do this, and she mentioned to me that when, for a moment, disburdened, delighted, he held her hand, thanking her for the sacrifice, she already felt rewarded. But was that all her reward? one of the ladies asked. She never saw him again. Oh, said the lady, which, as our friend immediately left us again, was the only other word of importance contributed to the subject till the next night, by the corner of the hearth, in the best chair, he opened the faded red cover of a thin, old-fashioned, gilt-edged album. I remember the whole beginning as a succession of flights and drops, a little seesaw of the right throbs and the wrong. After rising in town to meet his appeal, I had at all events a couple of very bad days, feeling I had made a mistake. In this state of mind, I spent the long hours of bumping, swinging coach that carried me to the stopping place at which I was to be met by a vehicle from the house. I found a commodious fly in waiting for me, and driving through a country, the summer sweetness of which served as a friendly welcome, my fortitude revived. I suppose I had expected something so dreary that what greeted me was a good surprise. The scene had a greatness that made it a different affair from my own scant home, and there immediately appeared at the door, with a little girl in her hand, a civil person who dropped me as decent a curtsy as if I had been a mistress or a distinguished visitor. I had no drop again till the next day, for I was carried triumphantly through the following hours by my introduction to the younger of my pupils. The little girl who accompanied Mrs. Gross affected me on the spot as a creature too charming not to make it a great fortune to have to do with her. She was the most beautiful child I had ever seen. It was thrown in as well from the first moment that I should get on with Mrs. Gross in a relation over which, on my way in the coach, I fear I had rather brooded. However... I felt within half an hour that she was glad to see me. 
It had been agreed between us that after this first night I should have Flora as a matter of course, and her small white bed would be arranged to that end in my room. What I had undertaken was the whole care of her, and she remained just this last time with Mrs. Gross only as an effect of our consideration for my inevitable strangeness and her natural timidity. There were naturally things that in Flora's presence could pass between us only as prodigious and gratified looks, obscure and roundabout allusions. And the little boy, does he look like her? Is he too so very remarkable? Oh, miss, most remarkable. You will be carried away by the little gentleman. My other pupil, as I understand, comes back tomorrow. Not tomorrow, Friday, miss. He arrives as you did by the coach, under care of the guard, and is to be met by the same carriage. I forthwith wanted to know if the proper, as well as the pleasant and friendly thing, wouldn't therefore be that I should await him with his little sister. A proposition to which Mrs. Gross assented so heartily that I took her manner that we should, on every question, be quite at one. Oh, she was glad I was there. What I felt the next day was, I suppose, nothing that could fairly be called a reaction from the cheer of my arrival and of my new circumstances. I reflected that my first duty was to win the child into the sense of knowing me. I spent the day out of doors with her. I arranged with her, to her great satisfaction, that it should be she, she only, who might show me the place. I have not seen Bly since the day I left it, but with my little conductress, with her hair of gold and her frock of blue, I had the view of a castle of romance inhabited by a rosy sprite. Wasn't it just a storybook, over which I had fallen a doze and a dream? No. It was a big, ugly, antique, but convenient house, in which I had the fancy of our being almost as lost as a handful of passengers in a great, drifting ship. Well, I was strangely at the helm. This came home to me when, two days later, I drove over with Flora to meet the little gentleman, and all the more for an incident that, presenting itself the second evening, had deeply disconcerted me. The post-bag contained a letter for me, which, however, in the hand of my employer, I found to be composed but of a few words enclosing another addressed to himself, with a seal still unbroken. This I recognise is from the headmaster. Read him, please. Deal with him. But mind you don't report. I had better have left the letter till morning, for it gave me a second sleepless night. I determined to open myself to Mrs. Gross. What does it mean? The child's dismissed his school. He may never go back at all. They won't take him, she said. They go into no particulars. That can have but one meaning, that he's an injury to the others. Master Miles, him an injury. It's too dreadful, continued Mrs. Gross. See him, miss, then believe it. I felt forthwith a new impatience to see him. I take it you've never known him to be bad, I said. I don't pretend that. I was upset again. Then you have known him? Yes, indeed, miss, thank God. You like them with the spirit to be naughty. So do I, I eagerly brought out. The next day, as the hour for my drive approached, I cropped up in another place. What was the lady who was here before? The last governess. She was also young and pretty. Was she careful? Particular? About some things, yes. But not about all. Well, miss, she's gone. I won't tell tales. I quite understand your feelings. Did she die here? No. She went off. She was taken ill, you mean, and went home? She was not taken ill. She left for a short holiday, but never came back. I was a little late on the scene of Miles' arrival, and I felt, 
as he stood wistfully looking out for me before the door of the inn, that I had seen him on the instant, without and within, in the great glow of freshness, the same positive fragrance of purity, in which I had from the first moment seen his little sister. It would have been impossible to carry a bad name with a greater sweetness of innocence, and by the time I had got back to Bly with him, I remained merely bewildered by the sense of the horrible letter locked up in one of the drawers in my room. As soon as I could compass a private word with Mrs. Gross, I declared to her that it was grotesque. She promptly understood me. You mean the cruel charge? It doesn't live an instant. My dear woman, look at him. What will you do then? She immediately added. I was wonderful. Nothing at all. In the first weeks, the days were long. The children often gave me what I used to call my own hour, the hour when, for my pupils, tea time and bedtime having come and gone, I had before my final retirement a small interval alone. Much as I liked my companions, this hour was the thing in the day I liked most, and I liked it best of all when the light faded. It was a pleasure at these moments to take a turn into the grounds and enjoy the beauty and dignity of the place. It was also a pleasure to feel myself tranquil and justified, and I fancied myself, in short, a remarkable young woman. Well, I needed to be remarkable to offer a front to the remarkable things that presently gave their first sign. It was plump, one afternoon, in the middle of my very hour. One of the thoughts that, as I don't in the least shrink now from noting, used to be with me in these wanderings, was that it would be as charming a story suddenly to meet someone. Someone would appear there at the turn of a path, and would stand before me, and smile, and approve. That was exactly present to me, by which I mean the face was, when, on the first of these occasions, I stopped short, on emerging from one of the plantations, and coming into view of the house. What arrested me on the spot, and with a shock much greater than any vision allowed for, was the sense that my imagination had, in a flash, turned real. He did stand there, but high up, at the very top of the tower. This tower was one of a pair which flanked opposite ends of the house. I remember two distinct gasps of emotion, which were, sharply, the shock of my first and that of my second surprise. My second was a violent perception of the mistake of my first. The man who met my eyes was not the man I had precipitately supposed. An unknown man in a lonely place is a permitted object of fear to a young woman privately bred. I can hear again, as I write, the intense hush in which the sounds of evening dropped. The man who looked at me over the battlements was as definite as a picture in a frame. We were confronted across our distance, quite long enough for me to ask myself with intensity who then he was. We were too far apart to call to each other, but there was a moment at which, at shorter range, some challenge between us, breaking the hush, would have been the right result of our mutual stare. He was in one of the angles with both hands on the ledge, so I saw him, after a minute, slowly change his place. He passed, looking at me hard all the while, to the opposite corner of the platform. During this transit, he never took his eyes from me, and even as he turned away, still markedly fixed me. He turned away. That was all I knew. It was not that I didn't wait for more, since I was as deeply rooted as shaken. Was there a secret at Bly? A mystery of Udolpho? Or an insane, an unmentionable relative, kept in unsuspected confinement? I can't say how long I turned it over. I only recall that when I re-entered the house, darkness had quite closed in. The most singular part of it was the part I became, in the hall, aware of, in meeting Mrs. Gross. I had not suspected in advance 
that her comfortable face would pull me up, and I somehow measured the importance of what I had seen, by my thus finding myself hesitate to mention it. My real beginning of fear was one, as I may say, with the instinct of sparing my companion. On the spot, accordingly, in the pleasant hall, and with her eyes upon me, I, for a reason that I couldn't then have phrased, achieved an inward revolution, offered a vague pretext for my lateness, and went as soon as possible to my room. Here it was another affair. There were hours, from day to day, when I had to shut myself up to think. It wasn't so much yet that I was more nervous than I could bear to be, as that I was remarkably afraid of becoming so. For the truth I had now to turn over was simply and clearly the truth that I could arrive at no account whatever of the visitor with whom I had been so inexplicably, and yet, as it seemed to me, so intimately concerned. There was but one sane inference. Someone had taken a liberty rather monstrous. We had been subject to an intrusion of some unscrupulous traveller, and we should see him no more. The attraction of my small charges was a constant joy, leading me to wonder afresh at the vanity of my original fears. Work was all the romance of the nursery, and the poetry of the schoolroom. I made constant fresh discoveries about them. There was one direction, assuredly, in which these discoveries stopped. Deep obscurity continued to cover the region of the boy's conduct at school. There was, in this beautiful little boy, something extraordinarily sensitive, yet extraordinarily happy. He never, for a second, suffered. I took this as a direct disproof of his having really been chastised. He never spoke of his school, never mentioned a comrade or schoolmaster, and I, for my part, was quite too much disgusted to allude to them. But with this joy of my children, what things in the world mattered? I was dazzled by their loveliness. There was a Sunday to get on, when it rained with such force that there could be no procession to church. As the day declined, I had arranged with Mrs. Gross that should the evening show improvement, we would attend together the late service. The rain happily stopped, and I prepared for our walk. Coming downstairs to meet my colleague in the hall, I remembered a pair of gloves that had been dropped in the dining-room, and I turned in to recover them. The day was grey enough, but the afternoon light still lingered, and it enabled me not only to recognise on a chair near the wide window, then closed, the articles I wanted, but to become aware of a person on the other side of the window and looking straight in. One step into the room had sufficed. My vision was instantaneous. The person looking straight in was the person who had already appeared to me. His face was close to the glass. He remained but a few seconds long enough to convince me he also saw and recognised. But it was as if I had been looking at him for years, and had known him always. Something, however, happened this time that had not happened before. His stare into my face, through the glass and across the room, was as deep and hard as then. But it quitted me for a moment, during which I could still watch it, see it fix successively several other things. On the spot there came to me the added shock of a certitude that it was not for me he had come. He had come for someone else. The flash of this knowledge, for it was a knowledge in the midst of dread, produced in me the most extraordinary effect, a sudden vibration of courage and duty. I say courage because I was beyond all doubt already far gone. I bounded straight out of the door again, reached that of the house, got in an instant upon the drive, and, passing along the terrace as fast as I could rush, turned a corner and came full in sight. But it was in sight of nothing now. My visitor had vanished. I stopped, almost dropped, with the real relief of this. But I took in the whole scene. I gave him time to reappear. The terrace and the whole place, the lawn and the garden behind it, the park, 
were empty with a great emptiness. Instead of returning as I had come, I instinctively went to the window. It was confusedly present to me that I ought to place myself where he had stood. I did so. I applied my face to the pane and looked, as he had looked, into the room. At this moment, Mrs. Gross came in from the hall. She saw me as I had seen my own visitant. She pulled up short, as I had done. I gave her something of the shock I had received. She turned white and retreated just on my lines, and I knew I should presently meet her. I wondered why she should be scared. She let me know as soon as she loomed into view. What in the name of goodness is the matter? She was now flushed and out of breath. With me? Do I show it? You're as white as a sheet. You look awful. I put out my hand to her, and she took it. Did I look very queer? Through this window? Dreadful. Well, I said, I've been frightened. Just what you saw from the dining room a moment ago was the effect of that. What I saw just before was much worse. Her hands tightened. What was it? An extraordinary man, looking in. Mrs. Gross gazed around us in vain. Then where is he gone? Have you seen him before? Yes, once, on the old tower. Yet you didn't tell me? No, for reasons. Mrs. Gross looked around again. What was he doing on the tower? Only standing there and looking down at me. She thought a moment. Was he a gentleman? I found I had no need to think. No. Nobody from the village? Nobody. I didn't tell you, but I made sure. But if he isn't a gentleman, what is he? He's a horror. God help me if I know what he is. Mrs. Gross said, putting herself together, it's time we should be at church. Oh, I'm not fit for church. You go. I must watch. She faced me again. Do you fear for the children? We met in another long look. Don't you? I couldn't have come out, she said. Neither could I. But I did come. I've my duty. So have I mine, she replied. What's he like? He's like nobody. Nobody? she echoed. He has no hat. He has red hair and a pale face, good features, and rather queer whiskers that are as red as his hair. His eyebrows are somewhat darker and look particularly arched. His eyes are sharp, strange, and his mouth's wide, and his lips are thin. He's tall, active, erect, but never a gentleman. A gentleman, he! Mrs. Gross gasped. You know him, then? She faltered but a second. Quint, she cried. Quint? Peter Quint. The master's valley when he was here. When was the master here? They were both here last year. Then the master went, and Quint was alone. I followed, but halting a little. Alone? Alone with us. And what became of him? She hung fire so long that I was still more mystified. He went too, she brought out at last. Went where? Her expression at this became extraordinary. God knows where. He died. Died? I almost shrieked. Yes, Mr. Quince, dead. It took, of course, more than that particular passage to place us together in presence of what we had now to live with. The revelation had left me for an hour so prostrate 
there had been for either of us no attendance on any service. What was settled between us accordingly was that we thought we might bear things together. We had gone over and over every feature of what I had seen. He was looking for someone else, you say? Someone who was not you? He was looking for little Miles. A portentous clearness now possessed me. That's whom he was looking for. But how do you know? I know. I know. My exultation grew. And you know, my dear. She didn't deny this, but said, What if he should see him? Little Miles. That's what he wants. She looked immensely scared again. The child. Heaven forbid. The man. He wants to appear to them. That he might was an awful conception. And yet somehow I could keep it at bay. Which, moreover, as we lingered, was what I succeeded in practically proving. I had an absolute certainty that I should see again what I had already seen. Something within me said that by offering myself bravely as the sole object of such experience, I should be able to guard the tranquillity of the rest of the household. The children in especial I should thus fence about and absolutely save. I recall one of the last things I said that night to Mrs. Gross. It does strike me that my pupils have never mentioned his having been here, and the time they were with him. They never alluded to it. The little lady doesn't remember. She never heard or knew. The circumstances of his death? Perhaps not. But Miles would remember. Miles would know. Ah, don't try him, broke from Mrs. Gross. Don't be afraid. But it is rather odd. You tell me they were great friends? Oh, it wasn't him, Mrs. Gross with great emphasis declared. It was Quint's own fancy. To play with him, I mean. Quint was much too free. This gave me a sudden sickness of disgust. Too free with my boy. Too free with everyone. I have it from you, then, that he was definitely and admittedly bad. I knew it, but I was afraid. Afraid of what? Quint. He was so clever and so Deep. Much as we had discussed it all that Sunday, how often and how passionately we came back to the subject in the days that followed. I scarce know how to put my story into words that shall be a credible picture of my state of mind. But I was in these days literally able to find a joy in the extraordinary flight of heroism the occasion demanded of me. I was there to protect and defend the little creatures in the world the most bereaved and the most lovable. We were united in our danger. They had nothing but me. And I, well, I had them. The more I saw, the less they would. I began to watch them in stifled suspense, a disguised tension that might well, had it continued too long, have turned to something like madness. What saved me, as I now see, was that it turned to another matter altogether. It didn't last a suspense, it was superseded by horrible proofs. Proofs, I say, yes, from the moment I really took hold. This moment dated from an afternoon hour that I happened to spend in the grounds with the younger of my pupils alone. We had left Miles indoors, on the red cushion of a deep window seat. He had wished to finish a book, and I had been glad to encourage a purpose so laudable in a young man whose only defect was a certain ingenuity of restlessness. His sister, on the contrary, had been alert to come out. I was aware afresh with her that I worked and played with them in a world of their own invention. They had no occasion whatever to draw upon mine. My time was taken only with being for them some remarkable person or thing that the game demanded. I forget what I was on the present occasion. I only remember that I was something very important and very quiet and Flora was playing very hard. We were on the edge of the lake, and, as we had lately begun geography, the lake was the Sea of Azov. Suddenly amid these elements I became aware that on the other side of the Sea of Azov we had an interested spectator. The way this knowledge gathered in me 
was the strangest in the world. I had sat down with a piece of work, and in this position I began to take in the certitude, and yet without direct vision of the presence, a good way off, of a third person. The old trees, the thick shrubbery, made a great and pleasant shade, but it was all suffused with the brightness of the hot, still hour. There was no ambiguity in anything, none whatever at least, in the conviction I from one moment to another found myself forming, as to what I should see straight before me and across the lake, as a consequence of raising my eyes. They were attached at this juncture to the stitching in which I was engaged, and I could feel once more the spasm of my effort not to move them, till I should have steadied myself as to be able to make up my mind what to do. There was an alien object in view, a figure whose right of presence I instantly and passionately questioned. Of the positive identity of the apparition, I would assure myself as soon as the small clock of my courage should have ticked out the right second. Meanwhile, I transferred my eyes straight to little Flora, who at that moment was about ten yards away. My heart stood still for an instant, with a wonder and terror of the question whether she too would see, and I held my breath while I waited for a cry, either of interest or of alarm. But nothing came. I was determined by a sense that within a minute all spontaneous sounds from her had dropped, and that also within the minute she had, in her play, turned her back to the water. That was her attitude when I at last looked at her looked with a confirmed conviction that we were still together under direct personal notice. After some seconds, I felt I was ready for more, and I again shifted my eyes. I faced what I had to face. I got hold of Mrs. Gross as soon after this as I could, yet I still hear myself cry as I fairly threw myself into her arms. They know! It's too monstrous! They know! They know! And what on earth? I felt her incredulity as she held me. Why, all that we know, and have knows what more besides, two hours ago in the garden, I could scarce articulate, Flora saw! Mrs. Gross took it as she might have taken a blow in the stomach. She has told you, she panted. Not a word. That's the horror. She kept it to herself. Mrs. Gross, of course, could only gape the wider. Then how do you know? I was there. I saw it with my eyes. Saw she was perfectly aware. Do you mean aware of him? No. Of her. Another person this time. But a figure of quite as unmistakable horror and evil. A woman in black, pale and dreadful, on the other side of the lake. I was there with a the child, and in the midst of the quiet hour, she came. Came how? From where? From where they come from. She just appeared and stood there. My friend, with an odd impulse, fell back a step. Was she someone you've never seen? Never. But somehow the child has. Someone you have. Then to show how I had thought it all out. My predecessor. The one who died. Miss Jessel. Miss Jessel. You don't believe me? I pressed. She turned right and left in her distress. How can you be sure? This drew from me in the state of my nerves a flash of impatience. Then ask Flora. She's sure? But I had no sooner spoken than I caught myself up. No. For God's sake. Don't. She'll say she isn't. She'll lie. Ah, oh, how can you? Because I'm clear. Flora doesn't want me to know. It's only then to spare you. No, no. There are depths, depths. The more I go over it, the more I see in it. And the more I see in it, the more I fear. I don't know what I don't see. What I don't fear. Mrs. Gross tried to keep up with me. You mean, you are afraid of seeing her again? Oh, no, that's nothing now. It's of not seeing her. But my companion only looked wan.
I don't understand. Why, it's that the child may keep it up, and that the child assuredly will, without my knowing it. Mrs. Gross tried a grim joke. Perhaps she likes it. Like such things. A scrap of an infant. Isn't it just proof of her blessed innocence? My friend bravely inquired. She brought me for an instant almost round. Oh, we must clutch at that. We must cling to it. If it isn't proof of what you say, it's proof of God knows what. For the woman's a horror of horrors. Mrs. Gross repeated. Tell me how you know. No. By seeing her. By the way she looked. At you, do you mean? Dear me, no. I could have borne that. She never gave me a glance. She only fixed the child. Mrs. Gross tried to see it. Fixed her. Ah, with such awful eyes. Do you mean of dislike? God help us, no. Of something much worse. Worse than dislike. With a determination. Indescribable with a kind of fury of intention. I made her turn pale. Intention. To get hold of her. That's what Flora knows. After a little, she turned round. The person was in black, you say. In mourning, rather poor, almost shabby, but with extraordinary beauty. Wonderfully handsome, but infamous. She slowly came back to me. Miss Jessel was infamous. They were both infamous. So for a little we faced it once more together, and I found absolutely a degree of help in seeing it now so straight. I must have it now. Was there something between them? There was everything. In spite of the difference. Oh, of their rank, their condition. She was a lady. The fellow was a hound, and did what he wished. With her. With them all. It must have been also what she wished. Poor woman. She paid for it. Yet you had then your idea? Of her real reason for leaving? Oh, yes. As to that, she couldn't have stayed. And afterwards I imagined. I still imagine. And what I imagine is dreadful. Not so dreadful as what I do. I don't do it, I sobbed in despair. I don't save or shield them. It's far worse than I dreamed. They're lost. What I had said to Mrs. Gross was true enough. There were in the matter I had put before her depths and possibilities that I lacked resolution to sound. Late that night, while the house slept, we had another talk in my room, when she went all the way with me as to its being beyond doubt that I had seen exactly what I had seen. It was a pity to be obliged to reinvestigate the certitude of the moment itself, and repeat how it had come to me as a revelation, that the inconceivable communion I then surprised must have been for both parties a matter of habit. Mrs. Gross told me, bit by bit, a great deal. It was neither more nor less than the particular fact that, for a period of several months, Quint and the boy had been perpetually together. She had informed Miss Jessel, and Miss Jessel had, with a very high manner about it, requested her to mind her business. Mrs. Gross had also directly approached Miles, what she had said to him was that she liked to see young gentlemen not forget their station. You reminded him that Quint was only a base menial, as you might say, and it was his answer that was bad. He repeated your words to Quint. No, not that. He denied certain occasions. What occasions? When he had gone off with a fellow and spent hours with him. I see. He lied. You see, after all, Miss Jessel didn't mind. She didn't forbid him. At all events, while he was with the man, Miss Flora was with the woman. It suited them all. 
It suited me too, I felt, only too well. By which I mean it suited exactly the particular deadly view I was in the very act of forbidding myself to entertain. His having lied and been impudent are, I confess, less engaging specimens than I had hoped to have from you of the outbreak in him of the little natural man. Still, I mused, they must do, for they make me feel more than ever that I must watch. I must wait. I waited and waited. And the days took, as they elapsed, something from my consternation. A very few of them, in fact, passing in constant sight of my pupils, without a fresh incident, sufficed to give grievous fancies, and even to odious memories, a kind of brush of the sponge. I have spoken of the surrender to their extraordinary childish grace as a thing I could actively promote in myself. And it may be imagined, if I neglected now, to apply at this source for whatever balm it would yield. I used to wonder how my little charges could help guess that I thought strange things about them. I trembled, lest they should see that they were so immensely more interesting. It would have been easy to get into a sad, wild tangle about how much I might betray. But the real account, I feel, of the hours of peace I could still enjoy was that the immediate charm of my companions was a beguilement still effective, even under the shadow of the possibility that it might be studied. They were at this period extravagantly and preternaturally fond of me. Their lessons got better and better. We lived in a cloud of music and affection and private theatricals. They were extraordinarily at one. Sometimes I came across little traces of understandings between them, by which one of them should keep me occupied while the other slipped away. There is a naive side, I suppose, in all diplomacy. But if my pupils practised upon me, it was surely with a minimum of grossness. It was all in the other quarter that, after a lull, the grossness broke out. I find that I really hang back. But I must take my horrid plunge. One evening, with nothing to lead up or prepare it, I felt the cold touch of the impression that had breathed on me the night of my arrival. I had not gone to bed. I sat reading by a couple of candles. I recall further both a general conviction that it was horribly late, and a particular objection to looking at my watch. I recollect, in short, that though I was deeply interested in my author, I found myself looking straight and hard at the room of my door. I laid down my book, rose to my feet, and taking a candle went straight out of the room, and from the passage, on which my light made little impression, noiselessly closed and locked the door. I went along the lobby, till I came within sight of the tall window that presided over the great turn of the staircase. At this point, I precipitately found myself aware of three things. They were practically simultaneous, yet they had flashes of succession. My candle, under a bold flourish, went out, and I perceived, by the uncovered window, that the yielding dusk of earliest morning rendered it unnecessary. Without it, the next instant, I knew there was a figure on the stair. I speak of sequences, but I required no lapse of seconds to stiffen myself for a third encounter with Quint. The apparition had reached the landing halfway up, and was therefore on the spot nearest the window, where, at the sight of me, it stopped short, and fixed me exactly as it had fixed me from the tower and from the garden. He knew me as well as I knew him, and so we faced each other in our common intensity. He was absolutely, on this occasion, a living, detestable, dangerous presence. But this was not the wonder of wonders. I reserve this distinction for quite another circumstance. The circumstance that dread had unmistakably quitted me, and that there was nothing in me unable to meet and measure him. I had plenty of anguish after that extraordinary moment, but I had... Thank God, no terror. And he knew I hadn't. I felt in a fierce rigour of confidence that if I stood my ground a moment I should cease, for the time at least, to have him to reckon with. It was the dead silence of our long gaze at such close quarters that gave the whole horror, huge as it was, its only note of the unnatural. I can't express what followed, save by saying that the silence itself became the element into which I saw the figure disappear, in which 
I definitely saw it turn and pass straight down the staircase and into the darkness in which the next bend was lost. I remained a while at the top of the stair, but with the effect presently of understanding that when my visitor had gone, he had gone. Then I returned to my room. The foremost thing I saw there by the light of the candle I had left burning was that Flora's bed was empty, and on this I caught my breath with all the terror that, five minutes before, I had been able to resist. I dashed at the place in which I had left her lying, and over which the white curtains had been deceivingly pulled forward. Then my step, to my unutterable relief, produced an answering sound. I noticed an agitation of the window-blind, and the child, ducking down, emerged rosily from the other side of it. She looked intensely grave, and I had never had such a sense of losing an advantage acquired, as on my consciousness she addressed me with a reproach. "'You naughty! Where have you been?' Instead of challenging her own irregularity, I found myself arraigned and explaining. She herself explained that she had known suddenly, as she lay there, that I was out of the room, and had jumped up to see what had become of me. "'You were looking for me out of the window,' I said. "'You thought I might be walking in the grounds?' "'Well, you know, I thought someone was.' "'Oh, how I looked at her now. "'And did you see anyone?' "'Ah, no,' she returned almost resentfully. "'At the moment, in my state of nerves, I absolutely believed she lied.' Why not break out at her on the spot and have it all over? Give it to her straight in her lovely little lighted face. You see, you know that you do, and that you already quite suspect I believe it. Therefore, why not frankly confess it to me, so that we may at least live with it together? Instead of succumbing, I sprang to my feet, looked at her bed, and took a helpless middle way. Why did you pull the curtain over the place to make me think you were still there? Flora... Luminously considered. Because I don't like to frighten you. But if I had, by your idea, gone out, she absolutely declined to be puzzled. And after a little, she got back into bed. You may imagine the general complexion from that moment of my nights. I repeatedly sat up till I didn't know when. I selected moments when my roommate unmistakably slept, and stealing out, took noiseless turns in the passage. I even pushed as far as to where I had last met Quint. But I never met him there again, and I may as well say at once that I on no other occasion saw him in the house. I just missed on the staircase, nevertheless, a different adventure. Looking down it from the top, I once recognized the presence of a woman on one of the lower steps, with her back presented to me, her body half-bowed, and her head in an attitude of woe in her hands. I had been there but an instant, however, when she vanished, without looking round at me. I knew, for all that, exactly what dreadful face she had to show. On the eleventh night after my latest encounter with Quint, I had quite my sharpest shock. It was precisely the first night during this series that, weary with vigils, I had conceived I might again, without laxity, lay myself down at my old hour. I slept immediately and, as I afterwards knew, till about one o'clock. But when I woke, it was to sit straight up, as completely roused as if a hand had shaken me. I had left a light burning, but it was out now, and I felt an instant certainty that Flora had extinguished it. This brought me to my feet, and straight, in the darkness, to her bed, which I found she had left. The child had got up again, this time blowing out the taper, and had again for some purpose of observation or response, squeezed in behind the blind and was peering out into the night. That she now saw as she had not, I had satisfied myself the previous time, was proved to me by the fact that she was disturbed neither by my re-illumination nor by the haste I made to get into slippers and into a wrap. Hidden, protected, absorbed, she evidently rested on the sill. The casement opened forward and gave herself up. There was a great still moon to help her, and this fact had counted in my quick decision. She was face to face with the apparition we had met at the lake, and could now communicate with it as she had not been able to do so. 
What I, on my side, had to care for was, without disturbing her, to reach from the corridor some other window turned to the same quarter. I got to the door without her hearing me. I got out of it, closed it, and listened from the other side for some sound from her. While I stood in the passage, I had my eyes on her brother's door, which was but ten steps off. What if I should go straight in, and march to his window? What if I should throw across the rest of the mystery the long halter of my boldness? This thought held me sufficiently to make me cross his threshold and pause again. I wondered if his bed were also empty. He was quiet. He might be innocent. The risk was hideous. I turned away. There were empty rooms enough at Bly, and it was only a question of choosing the right one. It suddenly presented itself to me as the lower one, though high above the gardens, in the solid corner of the house that I have spoken of as the old tower. I knew my way about in it, and had only to pass across it and unbolt in all quietness one of the shutters. I uncovered the glass and, applying my face to the pane, was able to see that I commanded the right direction. Then I saw something more. The moon made the night extraordinarily penetrable, and showed me on the lawn a person, who stood looking up to where I had appeared, looking, that is, not so much straight at me, as at something that was apparently above me. There was a person on the tower, but the presence on the lawn was not in the least what I had conceived, and had confidently hurried to meet. The presence on the lawn, I felt sick as I made it out, was poor little Miles himself. It was not till late next day that I spoke to Mrs. Gross, the rigour with which I kept my pupils in sight, making it often difficult to meet her privately. At the hour I now speak of, she had joined me under pressure on the terrace, where, with the lapse of the season, the afternoon sun was now agreeable. We sat there together, while before us, and at a distance, yet within call if we wished, the children strolled to and fro in one of their most manageable moods. They moved slowly in unison, the boy reading aloud from a storybook. Mrs. Gross offered her mind to my disclosures. I reached the point of what Miles had said to me when, after seeing him at such a monstrous hour, I had gone down to bring him in. As soon as I appeared in the moonlight on the terrace, he had come to me as straight as possible. I had taken his hand and led him through the dark spaces, up the staircase where Quint had so hungrily hovered for him, to his forsaken room. Not a sound had passed between us, and how I had wondered. Wondered if he were groping about in his dreadful little mind for something plausible and not too grotesque. He could no longer play at perfect propriety, nor could he pretend to it. It would tax his invention certainly, but he could do what he liked, with all his cleverness to help him. I was, of course, thoroughly kind and merciful. I had no alternative, however, in form at least, to put it to him. You must tell me now, and all the truth. What did you go out for? What were you doing there? I could still see his wonderful smile, the whites of his beautiful eyes, and the uncovering of his clear teeth shine to me in the dark. If I tell you why... Will you understand? My heart at this leapt into my mouth. Would he tell me why? I found no sound on my lips to press it, and I was aware of answering only with a vague, grimacing nod. Well, he said at last, just exactly in order that you should do this. Do what? Think me for a change. Bad! I shall never forget the sweetness with which he brought out the word, nor how, on top of it, he bent forward and kissed me. I could only say, Then you didn't undress at all? Not at all. I sat up and read. And when did you go down? At midnight. When I'm bad, I am bad. I see. It's charming. But how could you be sure I should know it? Oh, I arranged that with Flora. 
she was to get up and look out, which is what she did do. It was I who fell into the trap. So she disturbed you, and to see what she was looking at, you also looked. You saw. While you, I concurred, caught your death in the night air. How otherwise should I have been bad enough? He asked. Then, after another embrace, the incident and our interview closed on my recognition of all the reserves of goodness that, for his joke, he had been able to draw upon. It all lies in half a dozen words, I said to Mrs. Gross, words that really settle the matter. Think you know what I might do. He threw that off to show me how good he is. He knows down to the ground what he might do. That's what he gave them a taste of at school. Lord, you do change, cried my friend. I don't change. I simply make it out. The more I've watched and waited, the more i felt that if there were nothing else to make it sure, it would be made so by the systematic silence of each. Never, by a slip of the tongue, have they so much alluded to either of their old friends, any more than Miles has alluded to his expulsion. Even while they pretend to be lost in their fairy tale, they are steeped in their vision of the dead restored to them. He's not reading to her, I declared. They're talking of them. They're talking horrors. My lucidity must have seemed awful. Of what other things have you got hold? My friend asked. Why, of the very things that have delighted, fascinated, and yet, at bottom, as I now so strangely see, mystified and troubled me. They're more than earthly beauty. They're absolutely unnatural goodness. It's a game, I went on. It's a policy and a fraud. On the part of the little darlings? As yet, mere lovely babies. Yes, mad as that seems. They haven't been good. They've been absent. It has been easy to live with them, because they're simply leading a life of their own. They're not mine. They're not ours. They're his and hers. Quince? And that woman's? Quince and that woman's. They want to get to them. Oh, how had this poor Mrs. Gross appeared to study the children. But for what? For the love of all the evil that, in those dreadful days, the pair put into them. And to ply them with that evil still, to keep up the work of demons, is what brings the others back. Laws, said my friend under her breath. It was in obvious submission of memory that she brought out after a moment. They were rascals. But what can they do now? she pursued. Don't they do enough? I demanded. They can destroy them. They don't know as yet quite how, but they're trying hard. The success of tempters is only a question of time. They've only to keep to their suggestions of danger. For the children to come? perish in the attempt, unless, of course, we can prevent. Mrs. Gross slowly got up and turned things over. Their uncle must do the preventing. He must take them away. And who's to make him? You, miss. By writing to him that his house is poisoned, and his nephew and niece mad? My companion sat down again and grasped my arm. Make him at any rate come to you. I stared. To me? I had a sudden fear of what she might do. He ought to be here. He ought to help. I quickly rose, and I think I must have shown her a queerer face than ever yet. You see me asking him for a visit? No. With her eyes on my face, she evidently couldn't. She could see what I myself saw, his derision, his contempt, for the breakdown of my resignation at being left alone, and for the fine machinery I had set in motion to attract his attention to my slighted charms. She didn't know. No one knew. 
how proud I had been to serve him, and to stick to our terms. Yet she none the less took the measure, I think, of the warning I now gave her. If you should so lose your head as to appeal to him for me. She was really frightened. Yes, miss. I would leave on the spot, both him and you. It was all very well to join them, but speaking to them proved quite as much as ever an effort beyond my strength, offered in close quarters difficulties as insurmountable as before. This situation continued a month, and with new aggravations and particular notes, the note above all sharper and sharper, of the small, ironic consciousness on the part of my pupils. It was not... I am as sure today as I was then, my mere infernal imagination. It was absolutely traceable that they were aware of my predicament, and that this strange relation made, in a manner, for a long time, the air in which we moved. I don't mean that they did anything vulgar, for that was not one of their dangers. I do mean, on the other hand, that the element of the unnamed and the untouched became, between us, greater than any other and that so much avoidance couldn't have been made without a great deal of tacit arrangement. It was as if we were perpetually coming into sight of subjects before which we must stop short. There were days when I could have sworn that one of them had, with a small invisible nudge, said to the other, She thinks she'll do it this time, but she won't. To do it would have been to indulge, for instance, in some direct reference to the lady who had prepared them for my discipline. It was partly at such junctures as these, and partly at quite different ones, that with a turn my matters had now taken, my predicament, as I have called it, grew most sensible. The fact that the days passed for me without another encounter ought, it would have appeared, to have done something towards soothing my nerves. Since the light brush that second night on the upper landing, of the presence of a woman at the foot of the stair, I had seen nothing, whether in or out of the house. I had expressed to Mrs. Gross what was vividly in my mind, the truth that, whether the children really saw or not, since, that is, it was not definitely proved, I greatly preferred, as a safeguard, the fullness of my own exposure. How could I retrace today? the strange steps of my obsession. There were times of our being together when I would have been ready to swear that, literally, in my presence, but with my direct sense of it closed, they had visitors who were known and welcomed. My conclusions harassed me so that, sometimes, at odd moments, I shut myself up audibly to rehearse the manner in which I might come to the point. I approached it from one side and the other, while in my room I flung myself about, but I always broke down in the monstrous utterances of names. What it was least possible to get rid of was the cruel idea that, whatever I had seen, Miles and Flora saw more. Things terrible and unguessable, and that sprang from dreadful passages of intercourse in the past. Such things naturally left on the surface for the time, a chill that we vociferously denied we felt. And we had all three, with repetition, got into such splendid training that we went, each time, to mark the close of the incident, almost automatically through the same movements. It was striking of the children at all events to kiss me inveterately, with a wild irrelevance, and never to fail, one or the other, of the precious question that helped us through many a peril. When do you think he will come? Don't you think we ought to write? He, of course, was their uncle in Harley Street, and we lived in much profusion of theory that he might at any moment arrive to mingle in our circle. He never wrote to them, but it was a part of the flattery of his trust of myself. So I held that I carried out the spirit of the pledge given, not to appeal to him, when I let our young friends understand that their own letters were but charming literary exercises. They were too beautiful to be posted. I kept them myself, 
I have them all to this hour. This was a rule, indeed, which only added to the satiric effect of my being plied with a supposition that he might, at any moment, be among us. It was exactly as if our young friends knew how almost more awkward than anything else that might be for me. There appears to me, moreover, as I look back, no note in all this more extraordinary than the mere fact that, in spite of my tension and of their triumph, I never lost patience with them. Adorable, they must in truth have been, I now feel, since I didn't in those days hate them. Would exasperation, however, if relief had longer been postponed, have finally betrayed me? It little matters, for relief arrived. I call it relief, though it was only the relief that a snap brings to a strain, or the burst of a thunderstorm to a day of suffocation. It was at least change and it came with a rush. Walking to church a certain Sunday morning, I had little Miles at my side and his sister in advance of us and a Mrs. Gross's well in sight. It was a crisp, clear day, the first of its order for some time. The night had brought a touch of frost, and the autumn air, bright and sharp, made the church bells almost gay. Turned out for Sunday by his uncle's tailor, Miles' whole title to independence— the rights of his sex and situation, were so stamped upon him that if he had suddenly struck for freedom, I should have had nothing to say. I was by the strangest of chances wondering how I should meet him when the revolution unmistakably occurred. I call it a revolution because I now see how, with the word he spoke, the curtain rose on the last act of my dreadful drama and the catastrophe was precipitated. Look here, my dear, you know, he charmingly said. When in the world, please, am I going back to school? I stopped short, as if one of the trees of the park had fallen across the road. There was something new on the spot between us, and he was perfectly aware that I recognized it, though to enable me to do so, he had no need to look a whit less candid and charming than usual. I could feel in him how he already, from my at first finding nothing to reply, perceived the advantage he had gained. I was so slow to find anything that he had plenty of time after a minute to continue with his suggestive but inconclusive smile. You know, my dear, that for a fellow to be with a lady always, his my dear was constantly on his lips for me. It was so respectfully easy. I remember that to gain time, I tried to laugh. <laughs> and always with the same lady, I returned. The whole thing was virtually out between us. Oh, of course, she's a jolly, perfect lady. But after all, I'm a fellow, don't you see? Who's, well, getting on. And you can't say I haven't been awfully good, can you? No. I can't say that, Miles. <laughs> Except just that one night, you know. That one night? I couldn't look as straight as he. Why? When I went down, went out of the house. Oh, yes. But I forget what you did it for. You forget? He spoke with a sweet extravagance of childish reproach. Why? It was just to show you I could. Oh, yes, you could. And I can again. Certainly. But you won't. No, not that again. It was nothing. He resumed our walk with me, passing his hand into my arm. Then when am I going back? Were you very happy at school? He just considered. Oh, I'm happy enough anywhere. But I want to see more life. I want my own sort. It literally made me bound forward. There aren't many of your own sort, Miles. Unless perhaps, dear little Flora. You really compare me to a baby girl? Don't you then love our sweet Flora? If I didn't, and you too, if I didn't, he repeated, 
yet leaving his thoughts unfinished. Yes, if you didn't. He looked about the graves. Well, you know what? He didn't move and said, Does my uncle think what you think? How do you know what I think? Oh, well, of course I don't, for it strikes me you never tell me. But I mean, does he know? Know what, Miles? Why? The way I'm going on. I don't think your uncle much cares. Miles stood, looking at me. Then don't you think he can be made to? In what way? Why? By his coming down. But who'll get him to come down? I will, the boy said with extraordinary brightness and emphasis. He gave me another look charged with that expression, and then marched off alone into church. The business was practically settled from the moment I never followed him. I only sat there on my tomb and read into what our young friend had said to me the fullness of its meaning. He had got out of me that there was something I was much afraid of, and that he should probably be able to make use of my fear again to gain, for his own purpose, more freedom. My fear was of having to deal with the intolerable question of the grounds of his dismissal from school, since that was really but the question of the horrors gathered behind. The boy, to my deep discomposure, was immensely in the right to say to me, Either you clear up with my guardian the mystery of this interruption of my studies, or you cease to expect me to lead with you a life that's so unnatural for a boy. What was so unnatural for the particular boy I was concerned with was this sudden revelation of a consciousness and a plan. That was what really overcame me, prevented my going into the church. I reflected that I had already, with him, hurt myself beyond repair. For the first minute since his arrival, I wanted to get away from him. I might easily put an end to my ordeal by getting away altogether. Here was my chance. There was no one to stop me. I could give the whole thing up, turn my back and bolt. I got, so far as the immediate moment was concerned, away. I came straight out of the churchyard and, thinking hard, retraced my steps through the park. It seemed to me that by the time I reached the house, I had made up my mind to cynical flight. Tormented with difficulties and obstacles, I remember sinking down at the foot of the staircase, recalling that it was exactly where, more than a month before, in the darkness of night, and just so bowed with evil things, I had seen the spectre of the most horrible of women. I made in my turmoil for the schoolroom, where there were objects belonging to me that I should have to take. But I opened the door to find again, in a flash, my eyes unsealed. In the presence of what I saw, I reeled straight back on resistance. Seated at my own table in the clear noonday light, I saw a person. There was an effort in the way that, while her arms rested on the table, her hands with evident weariness, supported her head. At the moment I took this in, I had already become aware that, in spite of my entrance, her attitude strangely persisted. Then it was, with the very act of its announcing itself, that her identity flared up in a change of posture. She rose, with an indescribable grand melancholy of indifference and detachment, and within a dozen feet of me stood there, as my vile predecessor. Dishonoured and tragic, she was all before me. But even as I fixed, and for memory secured it, the awful image passed away. While these instants lasted, I had the extraordinary chill that it was I who was the intruder. It was as a wild protest against it that, actually addressing her, you terrible, miserable woman, I heard myself break into a sound that, by the open door, rang through the long passage and empty house. She looked at me as if she heard me, but I had recovered myself and cleared the air. There was nothing in the room the next minute but the sunshine and the sense that I must stay. I had so perfectly expected the return of the others to be marked by a demonstration that I was freshly upset at having to find them merely dumb and discreet about my desertion. I was left to study Mrs. Gross's odd face. 
But what happened to you? I only went for a walk, I said. Did the children give you a reason? For not alluding to your leaving us? Yes. They said you'd like it better. Did they say why I should like it better? No. Master Miles only said, We must do nothing but what she likes. I thought a moment. Between Miles and me, it's now all out. All out? My companion stared. But what, miss? Everything. I came home, my dear, for a talk with Miss Jessel. A talk? Do you mean she spoke? It came to that. I found her on my return in the schoolroom. And what did she say? That she suffers the torments of the lost, of the damned, and that's why to share them. I faulted myself with the horror of it, but my companion, with less imagination, kept me up. To share them? She wants Flora. Because you've made up your mind. But to what? To everything. To sending for their uncle. Oh, miss, in pity, do, my friend broke out. I see it's the only way. What's out, as I told you with Miles, is that if he thinks I'm afraid to, and has ideas of what he gains by that, he shall see he's mistaken. After all, it's their uncle's fault. If he left here such people, he really didn't in the least know them. Ah, oh, miss, you... Right. Well, tonight. I returned at last, and on this we separated. I went so far in the evening as to make a beginning. The weather had changed back. A great wind was abroad. I sat for a long time before a blank sheet of paper, and listened to the lash of the rain and the batter of the gusts. Finally I went out, taking a candle. I crossed the passage and listened a minute at Miles' door. His voice tinkled out. I say, you there, come in. It was gaiety in the gloom. I went in with my light and found him in bed. How did you know I was there? Why, of course, I heard you. Then you weren't asleep? Not much. I lie awake and think. What is it, I asked, you think of? What in the world, my dear? But you! I'd so much rather you slept. Well, I think also, you know, of this queer business of ours. Of what queer business, Miles? Why, the way you bring me up, and all the rest. What do you mean by all the rest? Oh, you know, you know. I could say nothing for a minute. Certainly you shall go back to school. If it be that that troubles you. Do you know you never said a word to me about your school? I mean the old one. Never mentioned it in any way? You seem to wonder. Haven't I? It wasn't for me to help him. It was for the thing I had met. Something in his tone and the expression of his face set my heart aching with such a pang as it had never yet known. So unutterably touching was it to see his little brain puzzled and his little resources taxed to play under the spell laid on him, a part of innocence and consistency. It was extraordinary how my absolute conviction of his secret precocity forced me to treat him as an intelligent equal. I thought you wanted to go on as you are. It struck me at this he just faintly coloured. I don't... I don't. I want to get away. I want a new field. I threw myself upon him, and in the tenderness of my pity, I embraced him. Dear little Miles. Dear little Miles. My face was close to his. Well, old lady. Is there nothing? Nothing at all you want to tell me? He turned off a little. I've told you. I told you this morning to let me alone. God knows I never wished to harass him, but I felt that merely at this to turn my back on him was to abandon, or, to put it more truly, to lose him. 
I've just begun a letter to your uncle, I said. Well, then finish it. I waited a minute. What happened before you came back? And before you went away? For some time he was silent, but he continued to meet my eyes. What happened? Dear little Miles, if you knew how I want to help you, I'd rather die than give you pain or do you wrong. Oh, I brought it out now even if I should go too far. I just want you to help me to save you. But I knew in a moment after this that I had gone too far. The answer to my appeal was instantaneous, but it came in the form of an extraordinary blast and chill, a gust of frozen air, and a shake of the room as great as if the casement had crashed in. The boy gave a loud, high shriek, which seemed a note of either jubilation or terror. Why, the candle's out, I then cried. It was I who blew it, dear, said Miles. The next day, after lessons, Mrs. Gross found a moment to say to me quietly, Have you written, miss? Yes, I've written. But I didn't add, for the hour, that my letter, sealed and directed, was still in my pocket. Miles had never at any rate been such a little gentleman, as when, after our early dinner on this dreadful day, he came round to me and asked if I shouldn't like him for half an hour to play to me. He sat down on the old piano and played as he had never played before. Where all this time was Flora? I went straight to my room, but she was not there. Surely she would be with Mrs. Gross. But she met my quick challenge with blank, scared ignorance. She'll be above, she presently said, in one of the rooms you haven't searched. No, she's at a distance. I had made up my mind. She has gone out. Mrs. Gross stared. She's with her. She's with her, I declared. We must find them. My friend stood there with her uneasiness. And where's Master Miles? Oh, he's with Quint. They'll be in the schoolroom. My tone had never yet reached so calm an assurance. The trick's played, I went on. They've successfully worked their plan. He found the most divine little way to keep me quiet while she went off. Divine, Mrs. Gross bewilderedly echoed. Infernal, then, but come. You leave him. So long with Quint? Yes. I don't mind that now. Because of your letter, she eagerly brought out. I quickly felt for my letter and laid it on the great hall table. Luke will take it. I reached the house door and opened it. I was already on the steps. My companion still demurred. You go with nothing on. I can't wait to dress. And if you must do so, I must leave you. Try meanwhile yourself upstairs. With them? Oh. On this the poor woman promptly joined me. We went straight to the lake, as it was called at Bly. My acquaintance with sheets of water was small, and the pool of Bly, at all events on the few occasions of my consenting, under the protection of my pupils, to a fronted surface in the old flat-bottomed boat moored there for our use, had impressed me both with its extent and its agitation. The usual place of embarkation was half a mile from the house, but I had an intimate conviction that, wherever Flora might be, she was not near home. She had not given me the slip for any small adventure, and since the day of the very great one that I shared with her by the pond, I had been aware in our walks of the quarter to which she was most inclined. This was why I had now given to Mrs. Gross's steps so marked a direction. What I judge most likely is that she's on the spot from which, the other day, we saw together what I told you. I've always been sure she wanted to go back alone, and now her brother has managed it for her. You suppose they really talk of them? They say things that, if we heard them, would simply appall us. And if she is there? Yes. Then Miss Jessel is. Beyond a doubt, you shall see there was no trace of Flora on that nearer side of the bank where my observation of her had been most startling, 
and none on the opposite edge. She has taken the boat. Then where is it? Our not seeing it is the strongest of proofs. She has used it to go over, and then has managed to hide it. All alone? That child? She's not alone, and at such times she's not a child. She's an old, old woman. But if the boat's there, where on earth is she? That's exactly what we must learn. And I started to walk further. By going all the way round? Certainly, far as it is. It will take us but ten minutes. However, in the course of a few minutes, we found the boat. It had been intentionally left, as much as possible, out of sight. I recognized, as I looked at the thick oars, the prodigious character of the feet for a little girl. There was a gate in the fence that brought us, after a trifling interval, more into the open. Then, there she is, we both exclaimed at once. Flora, a short way off, stood before us on the grass, and smiled, as if her performance had now become complete. The next thing she did, however, was to stoop down and pluck a big, ugly spray of withered fern. She waited for us, not herself, taking a step. She smiled, a smile, and we met. But it was all done in a silence, by this time flagrantly ominous. Mrs. Gross was the first to break the spell. She threw herself on her knees, and drawing the child to her breast, clasped in a long embrace the little, tender, yielding body. While this dumb convulsion lasted, I could only watch it, which I did the more intently when I saw Flora's face peep at me over her companion's shoulder. It was serious now, but it strengthened the pang with which I at that moment envied Mrs. Gross, the simplicity of her relation. Still, all this while, nothing more passed between us, save that Flora had let her foolish fern drop to the ground. What she and I had virtually said to each other was that pretexts were useless now. When Mrs. Gross finally got up, she kept the child's hand, so that the two were still before me, and the singular reticence of our communion was even more marked in the frank look she addressed to me. I'll be hanged, it said, if I'll speak first. It was Flora who was the first. Why, where are your things? Where yours are, my dear, I promptly returned. She had already got back her gaiety. And where's Miles? There was something in the valour of it that quite finished me. These three words from her were in a flash, like the glitter of a drawn blade. I'll tell you, if you'll tell me, I heard myself say, then heard the tremor in which it broke. Well, what? Mrs. Gross' suspense blazed at me, but it was too late now, and I brought the thing out handsomely. Where, my pet, is Miss Jessel? Just as in the churchyard with Miles, the whole thing was upon us. Much as I had made of the fact that this name had never once between us been sounded, the quick smitten glare with which the child's face now received it, fairly likened my breach of the silence to the smash of a pane of glass. Mrs. Gross, at the same instant, uttered the shriek of a creature scared, which in turn was completed by a gasp of my own. I seized my colleague's arm. She's there! She's there! Miss Jessel stood before us on the opposite bank. She was there. So I was justified. She was there for poor, scared Mrs. Gross, but she was there most for Flora. She rose erect, and there wasn't in all the long reach of her desire an inch of her evil that fell short. Mrs. Gross's dazed blink across to where I pointed struck me as showing that she, too, at last saw. The revelation then of the manner in which Flora was affected startled me in truth far more than it would have done to find her merely agitated, for direct dismay was, of course, not what I expected. To see her, 
without a convulsion of her small pink face, not even to feign to glance in the direction of the prodigy I announced, but only, instead of that, turn at me, an expression of hard, still gravity, an expression absolutely new and unprecedented, and that appeared to read and accuse and judge me. This was a stroke that somehow converted the little girl into a figure portentous. I called her passionately to witness. She's there, you unhappy little thing. There, there. And you know it as well as you know me. She simply showed me a countenance of deeper and deeper reprobation. I was by this time more appalled at what I may properly call her manner than at anything else, though it was quite simultaneously that I became aware of having Mrs. Gross also, and very formidably, to reckon with. My elder companion blotted out everything but her own flushed face and her loud, shocked protest, a burst of high disapproval. What a dreadful turn! To be sure, miss! Where on earth do you see anything? I could only grasp her more quickly yet, for even while she spoke, the hideous plain presence stood undimmed and undaunted. You don't see her, exactly as we see. You mean to say you don't see now? She's as big as a blazing fire. Only look, dearest woman. Look! She looked, just as I did, and gave me, with her deep groan of negation, repulsion, compassion, the mixture of her pity of her relief at her exemption, a sense, touching to me even then, that she would have backed me up if she had been able. I might well have needed that, for with this hard blow of the proof that her eyes were hopelessly sealed, I felt my own situation horribly crumble. I felt, I saw, my livid predecessor press from her position on my defeat, and I took the measure more than all of what I should have from this instant to deal with in the astounding little attitude of Flora. Into this attitude... Mrs. Gross immediately and violently entered. She isn't there, little lady, and nobody's there, and you never see nothing, my sweet. How can poor Miss Jessel, when poor Miss Jessel's dead and buried, we know, don't we, love? It's all a mere mistake and a worry and a joke, and we'll go home as fast as we can. Flora continued to fix me with her small mask of disaffection. She was literally... She was hideously hard. She had turned common and almost ugly. I don't know what you mean. I see nobody. I see nothing. I never have. I think you're cruel. I don't like you. She hugged Mrs. Gross more closely and buried in her skirts the dreadful little face. In this position, she launched an almost furious wail. Take me away! Take me away! Oh, take me away from her! From me? I panted. From you! From you! She cried. Even Mrs. Gross looked across at me dismayed. The wretched child had spoken exactly as if she had got from some outside source each of her stabbing little words. And I could, therefore, in the full despair of all I had to accept but sadly shake my head at her. If I had ever doubted, all my doubt would at present have gone. Of course I've lost you. I've interfered, and you've seen, under her dictation, the easy and perfect way to meet it. I've done my best, but I've lost you. Goodbye. For Mrs. Gross I had an imperative, almost frantic... Go! Go! Of what first happened when I was left alone, I had no subsequent memory. I only knew that at the end of, I suppose, a quarter of an hour, an odorous dampness and roughness, chilling and piercing my trouble, had made me understand that I must have thrown myself on my face to the ground and given way to a wildness of grief. I got up and looked a moment through the twilight at the grey pool and its blank, haunted edge, and then I took, back to the house, my weary 
and difficult course. Flora passed the night with Mrs. Gross. I saw neither of them on my return, but on the other hand I saw, as if by an ambiguous compensation, a great deal of miles. No evening I had passed at Bly was to have had the portentous quality of this one. On reaching the house, I had never so much as looked for the boy. I had simply gone straight to my room to change what I was wearing, and to take in, at a glance, much material testimony to Flora's rupture. Her little belongings had all been removed. When later, by the schoolroom fire, I was served with tea, I indulged in no inquiry whatever on the article of my other pupil. He had his freedom now. He might have it to the end. Well, he did have it. And it consisted, in part at least, of his coming in at about eight o'clock and sitting down with me in silence. On the removal of the tea things, I had blown out the candles and drawn my chair closer to the fire. I was conscious of a mortal coldness, and felt as if I should never again be warm. So when he appeared, I was sitting in the glow with my thoughts. He paused a moment by the door, as if to look at me, and then, as if to share them, came to the other side of the hearth and sank into a chair. We sat there, an absolute stillness. Yet he wanted, I felt, to be with me. Before a new day in my room had fully broken, my eyes opened to Mrs. Gross, who had come to my bedside with worse news. Flora was so markedly feverish that an illness was perhaps at hand. She had passed a night agitated above all by fears that had for their subject, not in the least her former, but wholly her present governess. I was on my feet at once, and with an immense deal to ask. She persists in denying to you that she saw, or has ever seen, anything? My visitor's trouble truly was great. Oh, miss, it isn't a matter on which I can push her. Yet it isn't either as if I much needed to. It has made her, every inch of her, quite old. The impression she gave me yesterday was, I assure you, the very strangest of all. It was quite beyond any of the others. I did put my foot in it. She'll never speak to me again. Hideous and obscure as it all was, it held Mrs. Gross briefly silent. And she said, I think indeed, miss, she never will. Has she said to you a single word about Miss Jessel? Not one, miss. I took it from her by the lake that just then and there there was nobody. And naturally you take it from her. What else can I do? Nothing in the world. Flora has now her grievance, and she'll work it to the end. Yes, miss. But to what end? Why, that of dealing with me to her uncle. What Flora wants, of course, is to get rid of me. My companion bravely concurred. Never again so much as to look at you. So that what you've come to me now for is to speed me on my way. Before she had time to reply, however, I had her in check. I've a better idea, the result of my reflections. My going would seem the right thing, and on Sunday I was terribly near to it. Yet that won't do. It's you who must go. You must take Flora away from here, away from them, straight to her uncle. Only to tell on you. No, not only. To leave me in addition with my remedy. She was still vague. And what is your remedy? Your loyalty, to begin with. And then Miles? She looked at me hard. Do you think he won't, if he has the chance, turn on me? Yes, I venture still to think it. At all events, I want to try. There's one thing, of course. They mustn't, before she goes, see each other for three seconds. Are you so sure of the little gentleman? I'm not sure of anything but you. But I have, since last evening, a new hope. I do believe that... 
poor little exquisite wretch. He wants to speak. Last evening, in the firelight and the silence, he sat with me for two hours, as if it were just coming. And did it come? No. Though I waited and waited. All the same, I can't, if her uncle sees her, consent to his seeing her brother, without my having given the boy a little more time. What do you mean by more time? Well, a day or two, really, to bring it out. He'll then be on my side. If nothing comes, I shall only fail. And you at the worst have helped me by doing on your arrival in town whatever you may have found possible. Unless, indeed, you really want not to go. She put out her hand to me as a pledge. I'll go. I'll go this morning. If you should still wish to wait, I'd engage she shouldn't see me. No, no. It's the place itself. Your idea's the right one. I myself, miss. Well, I can't stay. The look she gave me with it made me jump at possibilities. You mean that since yesterday you have seen? She shook her head with dignity. I've heard. Heard? From that child. Horace. Oh, thank God. It so justifies me. It does that, miss. She's so horrible. Really shocking. Ah, if you can't bear it. How can I stop with her, you mean? Why, just for that. To get her far from this. From them. She may be different. She may be free. Then in spite of yesterday, you believe? In such doings. I believe. There's one thing, of course, to remember. My letter, giving the alarm, will have reached town before you do. Your letter won't have got there. Your letter never went. What then became of it? Goodness knows. Master Miles... Do you mean he took it? I gasped. She hung fire, but she overcame her reluctance. I mean that I saw yesterday that it wasn't where you had put it. Luke declared he had neither noticed nor touched it. You see? Yes. I see that if Miles took it instead, he probably will have read it and destroyed it. And don't you see anything else? I faced her a moment with a sad smile. It strikes me that by this time your eyes are open even wider than mine. They proved to be so indeed, but you could still almost blush to show it. I make out now what he must have done at school. He stole. Well, perhaps. I hope then it was to more purpose than in this case. The note that I put on the table yesterday will have given him scant advantage, so that he's already much ashamed of having gone so far, for so little, and that what he had on his mind last evening was precisely the need of confession. Leave us. Leave us. I was already at the door, hurrying her off. I'll get it out of him. He'll meet me. He'll confess. If he confesses, he's saved. And if he's saved... Then you are? The dear woman kissed me on this, and I took her farewell. I'll save you without him, she cried as she went. Yet it was when she had got off, and I missed her on the spot, that the great pinch really came. Now I was, face to face with the elements, and for much of the rest of the day, while I fought my weakness, I could consider that I had been supremely rash. It was a tighter place still than I had yet turned round in, all the more that, for the first time, I could see in the aspect of others a confused reflection of the crisis. The maids and the men looked blank, the effect of which on my nerves was an aggravation, until I saw the necessity of making it a positive aid. It was, in short, by just clutching the helm that I avoided total wreck. To bear up at all, I became that morning very grand and very dry. I was quite remarkably firm. I wandered with that manner for the next hour or two, and for the benefit of whom it might concern... I paraded with a sick heart. 
The person it appeared least to concern proved to be, till dinner, little Miles himself. My perambulations had given me no glimpse of him, but I learned he had breakfasted, and then he had gone out for a stroll, he said. He had, at any rate, his freedom now. I was never to touch it again. To mark for the house, the high state I cultivated, I decreed that my meals with the boy should be served downstairs. In this room I felt afresh how my equilibrium depended on the success of my rigid will, the will to shut my eyes as tight as possible, to the truth that I had to deal with, was revoltingly against nature. I could only get on at all by taking nature into my confidence and account, by treating my monstrous ordeal as a push in a direction unusual, of course, and unpleasant, but demanding, after all, for a fair front, only another turn of the screw of ordinary human nature. What had Miles' intelligence been given him for but to save him? Mightn't one, to reach his mind, risk the stretch of a stiff arm across his character? It was as if, when we were face to face in the dining room, he had literally shown me the way. The roast mutton was on the table, and I had dispensed with attendance. Miles, before he sat down, said, I say, my dear, is she really very awfully ill? Little Flora? Not so bad that she'll presently be better. London will set her up. Bly had ceased to agree with her. Come here and take your mutton. He alertly obeyed me, carried the plate carefully to his seat, and when he was established, went on. Did Bly disagree with her so terribly all at once? Not so suddenly as you might think. One had seen it coming on. Then why didn't you get her off before? Before what? Before she became too ill to travel. I found myself prompt. She's not too ill to travel. The journey will dissipate the influence. Oh, I was grand. And carry it off. I see. I see. Miles, for that matter, was grand, too. He was discernibly trying to take for granted more things than he found, without assistance, quite easy. And he dropped into peaceful silence while he felt his situation. Our meal was of the briefest, and I had the things immediately removed. While this was done... Miles stood again with his hands in his little pockets and his back to me, stood and looked out of the wide window. We continued silent while the maid was with us. He turned round only when she had left us. Well, so we're alone. I imagine my smile was pale. Not absolutely. We shouldn't like that. No, I suppose we shouldn't. We've the others. We've indeed the others, I concurred. Yet even though we have them, he returned. They don't count much, do they? I made the best of it, but I felt wan. It depends on what you call much. Yes, everything depends. He remained there a while with his forehead against the glass. But an extraordinary impression dropped on me as I extracted a meaning from the boy's embarrassed back. None other than the impression that I was not barred now. This inference grew in a few minutes to sharp intensity and seemed bound up with the direct perception that it was positively he who was. I felt that I saw him, in any case, shut in or shut out. He was admirable, but not comfortable. I took it with a throb of hope. Wasn't he looking through the haunted pane for something he couldn't see? And wasn't it the first time in the whole business that he had known such a lapse? I found it a splendid portent. When at last he turned round to meet me, it was almost as if this genius had succumbed. Well, I think I'm glad Bly agrees with me. You'd certainly seem to have seen these twenty-four hours, a good deal more of it than for some time before. I hope you've been enjoying yourself. Oh, yes, I've been ever so far, all round about. I've never been so free. Well, do you like it? He stood there smiling. Then at last he put into two words. Do you? More discrimination than I had ever heard two words contain. 
Before I had time to deal with that, he continued, If we're alone together now, it's you that are most alone. But I hope you don't particularly mind. My dear child, how can I help minding? Though I've renounced all claim to your company, I at least greatly enjoy it. What else should I stay on for? He looked at me more directly. You stay on just for that? Certainly. I stay on as your friend. My voice trembled. Don't you remember how I told you when I came and sat on your bed the night of the storm that there was nothing in the world I wouldn't do for you? Yes, yes. He, on his side, more and more visibly nervous, had a tone to master. Only that, I think, was to get me to do something for you. It was partly to get you to do something I conceded. But you know, you didn't do it. Oh, yes, he said with the brightest superficial eagerness. You wanted me to tell you something. That's it, out, straight out, what you have on your mind. Ah. Then is that what you stayed over for? It was as if what I had yearned for had come at last only to astonish me. Well, yes. I may as well make a clean breast of it. It was precisely for that. He finally said, Do you mean now? Here? There couldn't be a better place or time. He looked round him uneasily, and I had the rare impression of the very first symptom I had seen in him, of the approach of immediate fear. It was as if he was suddenly afraid of me. Yet in the very pang of the effort, I felt it vain to try sternness, and I heard myself the next instant so gentle as to be almost grotesque. You want to go out again? Awfully. He smiled at me heroically, and the touching little bravery of it was enhanced by his actually flushing with pain. We circled about with terrors and scruples, fighters not daring to close. But it was for each other we feared. I'll tell you everything, Miles said. I mean, I'll tell you anything you like. You'll stay on with me, and we shall both be all right, and I will tell you. I will. But not now. Why not now? My resistance turned him from me, and kept him once more at his window, in a silence during which, between us, you might have heard a pin drop. Then he was before me again with the air of a person for whom, outside, someone who had frankly to be reckoned with, was waiting. I have to see Luke. I had not yet reduced him to quite so vulgar a lie and I felt proportionately ashamed. Well then, go to Luke, and I'll wait for what you promise. Only in return for that, satisfy before you leave me one very much smaller request. He looked as if he felt he had exceeded enough to be able to still bargain a little. Very much smaller? Yes, a mere fraction of the whole. Tell me if yesterday afternoon, from the table in the hall, you took my letter. My grasp of how he received this suffered for a minute from something that I can describe only as a fierce split of my attention. A stroke that at first, as I sprang straight up, reduced me to the mere blind movement of getting hold of him, drawing him close, instinctively keeping him with his back to the window. The appearance was full upon us that I had already had to deal with here. Peter Quint had come into view, like a sentinel before a prison. The next thing I saw was that from outside he had reached the window, and then I knew that he offered once more to the room his white face of damnation. On the second, my decision was made. It came to me in the very horror of the immediate presence that the act would be seeing and facing what I saw and faced, to keep the boy himself unaware. It was like fighting with a demon for a human soul. The face that was close to mine was as white as the face against the glass, and out of it presently came a sound, not low nor weak, 
but as if from much further away. Yes. I took it. I could feel in a sudden fever of his little body the tremendous pulse of his little heart. I kept my eyes on the thing at the window and saw it move and shift its posture. The scoundrel fixed as if to watch and wait. It was the very confidence that I might now defy him, as well as the positive certitude by this time of the child's unconsciousness that made me go on. What did you take it for? To see what you said about me. You opened the letter? I opened it. My eyes were now on Miles' own face, in which the collapse of mockery showed me how complete was the ravage of uneasiness. What was prodigious was that at last, by my success, his sense was sealed and his communication stopped. He knew that he was in presence, but you not of what, and knew still less that I also was, and that I did know. And what did this strain of trouble matter, when my eyes went back to the window only to see that the air was clear again, and, by my personal triumph, the influence quenched? There was nothing there. I felt that the cause was mine, and that I surely would get all. And you found nothing. I let my elation out. He gave me the most mournful headshake. Nothing. I kissed his forehead. It was drenched. So what have you done with it? I burnt it. Burnt it? It was now or never. Is that what you did at school? At school? Did you take letters or other things? Other things? Did you know I mightn't go back? I know everything. He gave me at this the longest, strangest look. Everything? Everything. What then did you do? He looked in vague pain all round the top of the room and drew his breath two or three times over. Well, I've said things. Only that? They thought it was enough to turn you out for. Well, I suppose I oughtn't. But to whom did you say them? I don't know. He almost smiled at me in the desolation of his surrender, which was indeed practically by this time so complete that I ought to have left it there. But I was infatuated. I was blind with victory. Was it to everyone? I asked. No. It was only two. I don't remember their names. Were there then so many? No, only a few. Those I liked. Those he liked. I seemed to float, not into clearness, but into a darker obscure. And within a minute there had come to me out of my very pity the appalling alarm of his being perhaps innocent. If he were innocent, what then on earth was I? I let him go a little, so that with a deep-drawn sigh he turned away from me again and faced toward the clear window. And did they repeat what you said? I went on after a moment. He was soon as some distance from me, still breathing hard and again with the air, though now without anger for it, of being confined against his will. Oh, yes, he nevertheless replied. They must have repeated them. To those they liked, he added. There was something less of it than I expected, but I turned it over, and these things came round. To the master's? Oh, yes, 
he answered very simply. But I didn't know they'd tell. The masters. They didn't. They've never told. That's why I ask you. He turned to me again, his little, beautiful, fevered face. Yes, it was too bad. Too bad. What I suppose I sometimes said, to write home. What were these things? My sternness was all for his judge, his executioner. Yet it made him avert himself again. And that movement made me, with a single bound and an irrepressible cry, spring straight upon him. For there again, against the glass, as if to blight his confession and stay his answer, was the hideous author of our woe, the white face of damnation. I felt a sick swim at the drop of my victory and all the return of my battle, so that the wildness of my veritable leap only served as a great betrayal. I saw him, from the midst of my act, meet it with a divination, and on the perception that even now he only guessed, and that the window was still to his own eyes free, I let the impulse flame up to convert the climax of his dismay into the very proof of his liberation. No more! No more! No more! I shrieked to my visitant as I tried to press him against me. Is she here? Miles panted as he caught with his sealed eyes the direction of my words. Then, as his strange she staggered me, and with a gasp I echoed it, Miss Jessel! Miss Jessel! He with sudden fury gave me back. It's not Miss Jessel, but it's at the window, straight before us. It's there, the coward horror, there for the last time. At this he was at me in a white rage, bewildered, glaring vainly over the place, and missing wholly, though it now, to my sense, filled the room like the taste of poison, the wide, overwhelming presence. It's he? I was so determined to have all my proof that I dashed into ice to challenge him. Who do you mean by he? Peter Quince, you devil! His face gave again round the room its convulsed supplication. Where? There in my ears still, his supreme surrender of the name and his tribute to my devotion. What does he matter now, my own? What will he ever matter? I have you, I launched to the beast, but he has lost you forever. Then, for the demonstration of my work, there. There, I said to Miles. But he had already jerked straight round, stared, glared again, and seen but the quiet day. With the stroke of the loss I was so proud of, he uttered the cry of a creature hurled over an abyss, and the grasp with which I recovered him might have been that of catching him in his fall. I caught him. Yes, I held him may be imagined with what passion. But at the end of a minute, I began to feel what it truly was that I held. We were alone with a quiet day, and his little heart, dispossessed, had stopped.